The Economic and Social Council is another body of the United Nations, and that's the one that we as NGOs, as non-governmental organizations, do our work through. The Charter of the United Nations allows us, as non-governmental organizations, to provide advice, counsel, consultation to um, the UN through the Economic and Social Council. By its very name, you can imagine that it has to do with things like poverty, health, um, environment, education, um, trade, uh, development. And these are all things that we are very interested in promoting. And so this is a very good place for the NGOs to provide their information. We also hope in time that we may have more to do with the General Assembly, which carries out debates about everything um, in the UN. So in New York, those are the bodies that we work with. We can also work in Geneva, at the Commission on Human Rights. And there's another area where reform is under discussion. At the present time, the Human Rights Commission, which you think would want to be promoting everyone's human rights, women, children, men, human beings, poor, <coughs> racial minorities, would be a good place to make, you know, to bring any cases that were really <coughs> violations of those human rights according to international law. However, at the present time, it is so politicized that it's very difficult to get anything moving in a commission on human rights. One of the reasons uh, is because the, there are a number of nations which have been chastised about human rights, who have decided, who have been elected into the human rights commission. And, and it's very difficult then to get um, sanctions or action on human rights violations in Geneva at the present time. So the idea with the Council, they're talking about establishing a Council of Human Rights, which would also be in, which would be in Geneva. It would be an independent body, not under the Economic and Social Council, but its own body. <coughs> it would be. Um, a larger group that is presently on the, no, pardon me, a smaller group that is presently on the commission. And they would be elected regionally, but would have to have a two-thirds majority. And the slate of candidates from each region would have to be more than just the number of seats available. So that the chances of the election really, and there would be more specific criteria about who could be elected so that gross human rights violators such as Sudan, for example, would not be able to be on the council at the time that it was committing these kind of gross human rights violations. That has some chance, I think, of moving ahead. Although in the debate last September, they were not nearly as concrete about the efforts as we hoped that they would be, because the more direction they would give in their documents, in, in the General Assembly meeting last September, the easier it will be to come to a, to a definitive description of what this might be. The NGOs, are, we're following that very closely because we want to be sure that if they move to this, <coughs> this um, structure, that we have at least as much access to it as we do the Human Rights Council, which is underneath the Economic and Social Council, which means that by charter we're allowed to participate in its deliberations, to its, um, not as a voting member, but to provide information and advice. So we'll see. The other element that's coming uh, under discussion is the Peace Building Commission. That would be a new structure altogether for the United Nations would be sort of a, an alternative to the Security Council. And the emphasis, as its name implies, would be on bringing peace, building peace, rather than simply trying not to have conflict. So a more positive approach. That indeed looks like it may go forward. The, I would guess by the end of December, there will be something fairly concrete come out about that. How it will function in the long term, I don't know. But I think it is a hopeful move that we're really looking more positively at peace and not simply um, 
this avoiding war, which isn't quite the same thing, as you know. The other place where we can work is in Vienna. And that's where we have the drugs and trafficking issues. Um, our our uh, the headquarters for the organizations that work with them are housed in Geneva. I haven't been there. We haven't been there. <coughs> but we're hoping to get more involved in Geneva, and then maybe ultimately in Vienna. <coughs> but we feel like the human rights area is the area where we want to work first. So that means that if we had if any one of your communities knew of a situation, for example, of where there were violations of human rights, we have the right to take that case to Geneva and present it in one way or another, even th through a written intervention or bringing people themselves to give testimony about that situation. Okay. Now this is what I already shared with you, but I just, I'll just go through the little diagram. It's really the process that we used and the, and the timeline to get our status as, as consultative status. The information in the newsletter, our organization and community commitments, our um, first annual meeting, the ongoing activities that we carry out. And we currently have the Department of Public Information which means that we receive information directly from the UN about what's going on, and then our job is to provide it for all of those who are our members so that they can know more about the United Nations. To give you a little local color here, this is our office in New York. It's about three blocks away from the United Nations headquarters. And so whenever you come to New York, you're invited to come and see us. And if you give us a little lead time, we can have you come for something at the United Nations. Um, this little corner here is my corner of the world. This person, Ana Martinez de Lugo, is a Carmelite Sister of Charity of the Verna. She works with me three days a week as a volunteer. Her community very much wanted to get right into the work at Unanima and make sure that they got the information back. So they provided Anna, and she's been with me for about a year, and she will be with me until um, June or July, I believe. And so she shares the work that we do. So right now we're one three-fifths time staff person. She's excellent. She's a Spanish national. She is, um, has spent 20 years in the Philippines. So she really knows very well both Spain and Europe and the Philippines, but her heart is in the Philippines. She's uh, also a very lovely person. In whenever I want to have someone that can schmooze with the with the delegates or you know be be the kind of person that people are attracted to, I always send her <laughs> because. I find myself, I'm, I'm a little shyer, and it's harder for me to go out to people in the same way. So, so Anna's really my, you know, she compliments very nicely the gifts that I have. Um, we share the office with two other NGOs, one with the International Presentation Association, and I know the Brigidines are very, you know them very well, particularly from Australia, I think, but here as well. Yes. yes. Um, and so Sharon Altendorf and I are in the same office, and then the Notre Dame de Nemours sisters are there too. So um, the Notre Dame sister, Joan Burke, has her office right here. And Sharon, who wanted a little more quiet, asked that the office be, you know, that she really be in a little room. So her office was set up as a room. And then this space here is our common space with a coffee machine, a copy machine, and a place to hang your coat. So if we have visitors, for, it'll seat four or five very nicely. You can have a little conference there. So as I say, three blocks. We moved into this office about a year and a half ago. And all of this furniture came in pieces. We, we, per, we didn't purchase it. It was offered to us free. But they said you'll have to assemble it, and that's probably going to cost you about six or seven hundred dollars. And I said, Oh no, it's not. 
So I asked my friend in the picture, who loves to do things with mechanical stuff, to come and help us set it up. So she came and she was there for about three days. And she laid out all these 150 or 300 pieces. I don't know how many there really were. It seemed like forever. And figured out without any directions how to put them together. So now we have office furniture, and the price was much better than six or seven hundred dollars. It's a little logo color there. Um, this was our first board of directors for Unanimous International. We have Sister Francisca Moto was from the uh, Carmelite, uh, Carmelite Charities of Ladruna, Gino Mara from the Holy Child, Janice Farnham from Religious of Jesus and Mary, 13 in two or three years. We expect a 14th congregation in um, March. The Sisters of Sion have indicated that they're going to apply. Our bylaws tell us we can have 15 because we want to really involve our communities. We want the expertise of the women in our communities to help us make do the advocacy work that we're interested in doing. We want to know about the communities. And we feel like if we have more than 15, it's just going to be too hard. Because in the beginning, I haven't said anything about the papers you have, but the um, second sheet is a chart that lists all the communities that belong to us across the top and the countries in which we're located down the side. And like my own community, when we are here, uh, we are in, I think, five different countries. And as I told you, I think we're about 1,500 to 2,000 people. Well, we represent now approximately more than 15,000 people, and then we're in 57 countries of the world. So that means we can bring the expertise of what's going on in all those 57 countries to help with the work that we want to do for systemic change, for structural change, for justice at the UN. I think you will, uh, those of you know that, that know Patricia Mulhall? Yes. Those of you that know Anne Marie Mack, you'll we'll see her there. And those of you that know Mary Lou Simcoe from the Holy Union, We'll see her there. And then the rest. The other new communities are for Sisters of Providence, Congregation of Notre Dame, Sisters of St. Anne. <coughs> I think that's it. And then the seven that were there originally. So here's our map that shows where we are now. And all these little dots that you see indicate places where our sisters and or associates are located. So to me, it's quite impressive to see how we've gone from, you know, a smaller number to a larger number and how much more expertise and how much more representation we can bring from around the world. So I'm just putting these, the names up uh, most of them are in the brochure, but the brochure was done a couple of years ago now, so it's not quite up to date on the last members of the communities. These are the founding communities. Oops, back on, sorry. And the thing in parentheses just indicates where the mother house of that um, congregation is, is located. And then these are the newer members. And I don't know if it's true that your mother house is located in Australia or Ireland or not, but at least many of your sisters are located there. So. And then the Sisters of Sign are the new ones. Okay. I already mentioned to you what our action focus was. Violence against women with a particular emphasis on trafficking. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we take that to mean something quite broad. Because we need, in order to advocate at the UN, we need to be able to fit into the things that the UN is talking about at a particular moment in time. And that isn't too hard to do, but we have to make it work for us. And so 
we, um, and that isn't the only reason we do this, but we feel that to be effectively working against trafficking, we need to do it through many different ways. One certainly is through education of ourselves and others, solidarity and prayer. Oops. Another is working against the causes of trafficking, poverty, patriarchy among them, patriarchy being <coughs> defined here as the system that privileges men. Not men, but the system that privileges them. And then work on things like HIV AIDS and employment strategies so that we have um, the connect, I mean, those are things that are definitely connected to trafficking. <coughs> if women were able to get decent work that paid well enough for them to live decently, then I think the situation, of, they would be much, much less vulnerable to trafficking. Children would be much less vulnerable to being trafficked because their families could care for them. If there was no trafficking and no prostitution, the spread of AIDS would be less of a problem. On, on the other hand, um, there'd be less contracting of HIV AIDS by women and children. So you can see that those are all connected. We try to connect what we work with somehow to trafficking. And it's not hard to do. So rather specifically, what do we do with the UN dual against trafficking? <laughs> well, we do it in several different ways. <coughs> I had a cold just before I came, so that's why I have these in my pocket. <laughs> anyway, um, we work through the trees that many countries have signed. That first one up there, CEDA, is the Convention to Eliminate All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And in that treaty, there's a statement that simply says that trafficking is, you know, is forbidden, it should be illegal, and all of that. There are many, many other statements in there related to discrimination against women, relating to, for example, the passing on of citizenship to your children. In some countries, it only goes through the father. Um, but in any case, the, it has, um, the CEDAW Treaty for related to women has something about that. And what have we done related to those treaties? Well, the way it works at the United Nations, any government that signs onto that particular treaty also agrees about every three or four years that it will do a report that says, what they've done to comply with the terms of that treaty in those three and four years. And for example, last year in January, Ireland gave its report. And I found it interesting that the head of the delegation for Ireland on the convention related to women was a man. That doesn't usually happen. Usually the governments um, choose a woman anyway to be the head of the delegation. And there's no reason why it couldn't have been a man, and it was, it was fine. Um, so the government does its report, the committee studies the report, prepares a number of questions that it might have relative to what the government is saying in the report, and then the government is allowed to come to the UN in a session, or invited to come, to actually present that report on a given day. Well, the Monday before it presents its report, the NGOs are invited, if they wish, to give each NGO that wants to, to speak to that report, give a five-minute presentation that's sort of an alternate report that might bring out some points the government had perhaps neglected, might have had small oversight, might have said something um, that isn't quite the experience of the uh, persons, the women and the children, the real child. So for example, in the case of Ireland, one of the points that was brought out was the discrimination against the traveler women. Another point that was brought out was the um, situation of women in prison. Another point that was brought out was by the NGOs was the situation or, or the percentage of women that are in public office in the parliament. And um, so the NGOs give these alternate reports. Then the day that the government gives a report, the committee members will say something often like, 
Well, we heard from a reliable source that such and such a situation is true in your country. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? 